So who's ready for Christmas? <laughs> Nobody? Somebody? Some of you are, I know. Some of you have been decorating and you're perfectly prepared, but not me. This week, I was delighted to have a visit by my birth mother and one of my half-sisters who came up for a few days from Virginia. And so I decided we would show them the best that Michigan has to offer as far as Christmas, which involved going to the mall and seeing the mall decorations, going to downtown Rochester and seeing the light show, and of course, driving up to Frankenmuth and going to Bronner's which maybe I never have to do again in my life, I don't know. <laughs> we, we walked around and saw, I mean, it's amazing. I'm sure you've all been there. It's an absolutely amazing uh, explosion of Christmas. Year round, you can go and just immerse yourself, mostly, I think, in nostalgia. What my birth mother particularly liked were the Christmas villages. They have them all set up. I didn't realize they had them thematic, like Harry Potter Christmas Village, and Nightmare uh, Before Christmas, but the ones she likes were the old tiny ones, right? You have the, the Christmas village from, the, from Dickens. Think of a Christmas carol, right? Doesn't that just bring warm feelings of nostalgia to your heart? The nostalgia that I think we want to feel this time of year, all those traditions that we have, the particular cookies that we like, the particular rituals and traditions of our families, that we want to pass on, and those are lovely and wonderful. But the Dickens uh, village was bothering me for some reason. When we came home from Browners, I was like, something wrong with this Dickens village. I don't know if you've read a lot of Charles Dickens, but there is nothing very nostalgic about the world that Charles Dickens wrote about. Think of Bleak House, right? Think of I, when, I, when I think of Dickensian, what I think of is going to the poorhouse. I think of child labor in sweatshops. I think of crushing and abject poverty. Even A Christmas Carol, which is the most kind of nostalgic of his works, Bob Cratchit's life is terrible, right? He barely gets half a day off for Christmas and he doesn't have enough money to feed his family or to provide health care for his son, Tiny Tim. He relies on the generosity of Scrooge to make his life better. So this Christmas village, this nostalgia thing got me thinking, why is nostalgia so great? I think it's because we yearn in a world that seems completely messed up and often very dark in which we're struggling with all kinds of problems, right? We deal with illness in our family. A friend had lost like three friends in the last a year, and they were just feeling the weight of grief this year. We deal with conflicts in the world and politics, and so nostalgia gives us an escape, right? It's a safe place where we can go and look back to the time when things were better. This kind of idealized past of that the Dickens Christmas Village. We look at all those beautiful homes and all the carolers in their beautiful outfits and we get a warm feeling. Nostalgia, however, is not something that our Christian faith really offers us. God doesn't say to us, oh, go back to the good old days when you were without Christ, right? The, the good old days when we look at our biblical faith, our Christian faith, are, are not where the focus is. Even the prophets who tell us about the past, they do so to help us actually live more fully in the present and to look forward to the future. Jesus did not come to help us go backwards, but instead to go forward. Think of the beautiful words of the prophet Isaiah. This is one of my favorite passages from Isaiah. Virginia Higgins was telling me she's been reading in a Bible study the entire book of Isaiah for the last, how many months, Virginia? Six months? Almost a year. She's been in the book of Isaiah for a year, and it's pretty, there's a lot of it that's pretty doom and gloom, isn't there? 
the prophecies of destruction. Isaiah was not somebody who didn't know the problems of the world. He lived through catastrophes, right? He watched his kingdom crumble from the inside through the corruption of the king. He watched the people abandon God. He saw foreign armies gathering to conquer and eventually destroy the city of Jerusalem. Isaiah was no stranger to real life problems. And yet, in today's reading, he's able to look ahead and to see through the problems of today to the future that God is building, a vision of the kingdom of God, the peaceable kingdom that does not go back to the Garden of Eden, but brings the Garden of Eden into our future. No longer, Isaiah says, will there be predators and prey they will now live together in harmony. The wolf shall lie down with the lamb. Little children can play with poisonous snakes and not be harmed. There will be a, a reunion of all of creation in peace and in harmony and justice. That is the future the vision that Isaiah gives the people to cling to during the times when their life is falling apart. Don't look back, he says. Look forward to what God is doing. In the same way, John the Baptist, that crazy prophet on the banks of the Jordan, who wore camel's hair and ate locusts and wild honey, he saw the same problems. He saw the corruption of the royal house in Judah with King Herod. He saw the, the calcification, this kind of rigidity in the religious leadership of his day. And he said, people are hungry for God. They're hungry for a change. They need God in their lives. And so he invents this ritual of baptism. He says, come to the Jordan and I will baptize you with repentance. And what does he mean by repentance? We read this passage as destruction, right? When we look at that, all oh, the chaff he's gonna burn with unquenchable fire. So let's say this side of the church, I know you all pretty well. Are you the chaff or the wheat? Are you gonna be stored in the granary or are you gonna be burned? What about this? I don't know about this side. <laughs> There's some chaff over here, I'm sure. But I don't think that's what John is talking about. Because John is in a long line of prophets like Malachi who said that God's fire does not destroy, it purifies. God's fire helps to burn away the things in you which are holding you back, which are making your life miserable. This burning is a cleansing and refining fire which will only leave the pure uh, self intact. It's not destructive, it is restorative. That's what John's talking about. Not destruction, but purification. He says, come and be purified. Come and receive this baptism of water. And he too looks forward. He says, one is coming after me, the likes of which I can't even imagine. I'm not worthy to hold his sandals and his baptism is truly going to transform you into what God intends. John invites us to repent, which really just means changing direction. Have you been going the wrong direction? Have you been looking back? Have you been so trapped in nostalgia for a past? And you know what, nostalgia, here's the other thing with nostalgia. We as human beings have terrible memories. I mean, I confess, my memory is bad, but so is yours. Because what happens in the human brain is that we remember what we want to remember. If you ask three people who watch a car accident what they remember, they are never going to agree. We change, our memories actually get rewritten. Did you know that? Things that you know are true from your past your brain can rewrite them if someone gives you a suggestion. I have vivid memories of my childhood that did not happen. But I was told stories and they kind of merged together and that's what sticks in my mind. We can't trust our memories 
of a nostalgic past. Instead, what the Bible encourages us to do, what our Christian faith encourages us to do, what the prophet Isaiah and John the Baptist encourage us to do is to face reality with open eyes, to deal with reality as it is, and to look forward to God's promise of hope. Hope is the key, not nostalgia. This Advent season, as we prepare again to celebrate the birth of Jesus with all the warm feelings of nostalgia that we have, with all the traditions of our families and our church, the Rochester Christmas Parade, the lights, the trees, the presents, everything. Let's also remember to take time for hope. Let's practice the spiritual practices that Father John gave us last week that we're printing in the bulletin. Because that's how we do it. That's how we live in hope is to ground ourselves in the reality of this present time and the reality of God's love for us, God's surpassing love, God's love which draws us out of ourselves and into this peaceable kingdom which he is preparing for us and that we can practice right now by living lives that are kind, and generous, and loving, and hopeful. May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, may the God of hope fill you with all spiritual joy and benediction. Amen. Amen.